Hello and welcome to another episode of Alaska Weather. Today is Wednesday, March 7th, 2018. I'm Kimberly Hepner, and in just a moment, I'll be on with your aviation, marine, and public forecast. Remember, you can always access the forecast by dialing 1-800-472-0391 or go going on the internet to the address weather.gov forward slash Alaska. If you have any questions about the show, you can email David Snyder at david.snyder at noaa.gov. That's our TV lead. Now let's go take a look at the headlines for the day. I'm going to step out of the screen for just a moment here and let you read these along with me. So what we're looking at is winter weather continues for the West Coast. Uh, the impacts have continued since early this morning and they will continue through the late night hours into Thursday. Now we have snow reports from the southeast up to six inches for Pelican, Haines and Skagway. So those were the highest snow totals that have come in so far today. Now blowing snow is expected along the north coast so be aware if you're along that north slope there we are going to see increased wind speeds. And then we're also going to see additional snow and higher snow amounts for uh, the southern areas of the Kenai and look for those gusty winds to start blowing late tonight through Thursday. Now let's take a look at the watches, warnings, and advisories across the area. We're going to take a look over at the southeast. Uh, initially, we do have a winter weather warning for the Yakutat area, and that's just out through the evening hours as well as uh, for areas around Juneau and Sitka. Expect a couple more inches of snow through the evening. Now let's take a look at the West Coast. The West Coast, we're seeing uh, quite a few advisories and warnings out there, and this is for snow that's uh, coming along with the front that's pushing inland today. We're expecting snow amounts mainly between one to three inches with isolated amounts up to six inches. In addition, we're expecting uh, reduced visibilities along blowing snow, which will be gusting up to 45 miles per hour out of the southwest. So travel, travel conditions for all of these areas are going to be difficult. Now let's take a look over the southwest area, and that's going to be a winter weather uh, warning for snow as we're going to see increased snow amounts, especially tomorrow with the new developing low pressure system. Uh, mainly along the Alaska Range, we'll see the highest snow amounts between 10 to 12 inches. Along the Kenai here, mainly uh, south on the southern tip of the Kenai, we're going to be seeing some higher snow amounts between 3 to 6 inches tomorrow, along with very gusty winds. So that'll cause some blowing snow, reduced visibility situations for the Kenai as we head through the day on Thursday. Now let's take a look at the satellite and let's go back to the west areas because this is where the largest storm system is. Here we got a center that you can see curling up on the satellite. This is a mature system at this point. It's got a large area of cold air advection in on the back side of it, uh, noted by these puffy white clouds. So uh, ahead of the system, we're advecting some fairly moist air, and this is coming up from the Pacific, bringing the plume into the southwest this afternoon. I believe that's what's going to help give those higher snow amounts when we get into Bristol Bay for the, the front that moves in tomorrow. Now let me take and move this one more time, and you can see this plume just heading in towards the Bristol Bay area with an extension. Uh, this comet cloud is extending all the way from Kamchatka southward. Now let's take a look over at the southeast, and we can't see too much definition in the disturbance around the northeastern gulf, but there's a tiny spin. If you look closely, I'll put it into motion one more time. You can see that spin is just about southeast of Yakutat, with a plume of moisture heading right for the southeast. So plenty of moisture to help feed that snow along the boundary, situated along the coastal areas th through the evening hours with some light rain across the eastern waters there. Now most of the inland locations are going to stay dry for the overnight period with just some light snow uh, across a few areas with the upper level disturbances moving away from the main low center, which is a 979 millibar low. It's, it's an occluded front with a warmer air mass just along the eastern areas of the bearing. So we were seeing some light rain reports there near Cape Newingham, uh, just along the edge of Bristol Bay. So we have mixed precip along the, east, the southeastern bearing waters 
with rain extending from the western Alaska Peninsula and southward. Now here's the cold front on the southern end of the low pressure system extending back towards the western and central Aleutians there. And we're going to see this system advancing further to the east. So expect uh, snow to be spreading further inland across the southwest during the overnight hours, thus continuing most of the warnings and advisories through uh, late tonight and through early Thursday morning. And then we'll see the very gusty winds also developing on the backside of this low pressure system. We'll see some fairly gusty conditions between 30 to 50 miles per hour on your um, overnight hours. Now, the next low pressure system to watch is right here, developing along the Alaska Peninsula tonight. Uh, this will bring some mixed precipitation up through about Kodiak Island. And then out towards the east, the low pressure system that's currently there is going to be weakening but still allowing a few showers to develop along an axis. Now, as we head into Thursday, this low pressure system along the Alaska Peninsula is going to take control and be spinning somewhere near the southern tip of the Kenai. And that's going to be bring that front along the Kenai with another frontal boundary from the low, the parent low from the bearing as it kind of scoots into the Kuskokwim Delta there. Now, expect ongoing snow activity across uh, the eastern areas of Bristol Bay. So that's where we're expecting the highest accumulations there. Now, low pressure uh, uh, along the western Gulf, we're going to see an increase of winds also along the, this system. So look for those winds to be pulling through Turnagain Arm and moving up through the Prince William Sound on Thursday. We're, we're expecting gusts to be storm force for marine areas of the Prince William Sound. So that's 50 knots for the Prince William Sound, very gusty conditions there through Portage. On average, um, expect sustained winds between 15 to 30 miles per hour along the eastern Kenai here. Now along the backside of the low pressure system out in the western bearing, that westerly flow, north to northwesterly flow, is going to pull through the Alaska Peninsula and we'll see snow shower activity continuing on the backside of this system. Now, Conditions are, are expected to be gusty as well for the north coast, and here's that blowing snow that I mentioned. That will be developing tomorrow, so we'll see those gusty winds pick up with this situ uh, the situated low pressure system moving a little bit further to the east. That's going to tighten the gradient along the north coast there. So gusty winds will pick up, and then as we head into the day on Friday, conditions will improve overall statewide. It'll be a very broad low, but in control of the weather across the entire state. And we'll see mainly snow shower activity around the system, lots of gusty winds, especially with the cold infection on the backside. Now for the southeast, they'll be seeing a mix of rain and snow showers, but like I said, accumulations aren't expected to be as much as we head into your Friday. Now let's take a look at your temperatures for Thursday morning. Heading into the morning hours, coldest areas will be across the north and eastern areas of the state, down into the lower sing single digits to just about 10 below, especially uh, for Arctic Village there in the northeast. And now for the southeast, expect temperatures to be in the upper 30s, I'm sorry, upper 20s to lower 30s, and very similar conditions across the Alaska Peninsula and 20s all along the west coast primarily with some uh, temperatures in the teens when you get north of the Seward Peninsula. Now across the Gulf, temperatures will be in the 20s. Across the Bering, a little bit cooler out across the west there in the lower 30s tonight. Now as we head through the afternoon hours on Thursday, warmest across the Alaska Peninsula and eastern Aleutians in the lower 40s are expected. And then across the southern tier of the state, mainly in the lower 30s, with some warmer temperatures creeping into Kodiak near 40. Across the northern tier of the state, temperatures will get up into the lower uh, 10 degree range uh, to lower teens. And across the eastern areas of the state in the mid 20s and the southeast, uh, reaching into the mid-30s by the middle of the day. Now for a Friday morning, expect a very similar repeat of temperatures, slightly warmer there across the southeast in the lower 30s. The northern and eastern areas, once again, the coolest areas in the state, and a little bit cooler as that low pushes in uh, off the bearing on Friday morning. So that'll also reduce temperatures across most of the bearing in the mid-20s to lower 30s. And then Friday temperatures will be slightly cooler till uh, through the end of the week with temperatures mainly in the 
20 to 30 degree range across the southern tier of the state, the warmest areas along the Aleutian chain and Kodiak Island. And for the southeast, temperatures will be in the mid-30s to lower 40s. So staying cool there across most of the state. And now in just a few minutes, we'll be back with your aviation forecast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Tomorrow's flying weather is going to look much like the previous days as we're going to see widespread IFR to MVFR conditions across the state. We do have a little bit of a break between across the northern areas of the Brooks Range. However, the southern Brooks Range will be in that IFR to MVFR ceiling. Now, across the southern tier of the state, very much the same across the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, we are going to see mainly MVFR across the central areas of the Bering with IFR conditions across the western areas. Perhaps um, a short break of IF, uh, VFR conditions across the eastern Bering. Now across the southeast, expect widespread IFR conditions with snow tomorrow morning. So reduced visibilities and ceilings across the southeast and the panhandle. The areas across the Gulf are going to be mainly MVFR for the eastern areas and IFR to the west. Now let's take a look at the afternoon. We will see some improvement across the southeast. However, those northern channels are going to stay in IFR conditions as well as the northern panhandle. We'll see widespread IFR conditions across the southern areas of the state into the southern areas of the Gulf and we'll see IFR hanging on just to the south of the Brooks Range. Looking across the northern tier, we will see a brief VFR condition for those locations, but widespread MVFR conditions will hang on across much of the western areas of the state, with IFR continuing across the eastern Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula. IFR will also be across much of the bearing for your Thursday afternoon. Now as we head into Friday, uh, expect the morning hours to be widespread IFR across much of the state, including the southeast, back down to IFR for you, and then we will see widespread MVFR conditions across the Gulf of Alaska. For Friday afternoon, expect conditions to be improving across the area. We'll see some IFR conditions across the central and northern tier of the state, otherwise MVFR across um, the uh, interior locations, and we'll see IFR conditions continuing across the central areas of the Bering, otherwise MVFR conditions are gonna be widespread. Now let's take a look at the passes in more depth We'll see Anatuvik tomorrow all day, IFR, as well as Adigan Pass will be in the IFR condition. Now, Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will go from IFR to MVFR late day, and we'll see Rainy Pass stay down in IFR conditions. Windy will also be in IFR, and Isabel stays IFR tomorrow, and Mentasta will be MVFR all day. And then we'll see Tanita go from MVFR to IFR and Portage IFR. Well, let's take a look at Chilkoot White Pass, IFR conditions for you tomorrow. Now, if you're looking at the freezing levels for tomorrow morning, that's going to be draped across the southeast and hugs along the northern coast and back towards the central areas of the Bering. Now, uh, conditions are going to be a little bit colder with height rises from two to 6,000 feet just south of the Alaska Peninsula, starting up there at Kodiak Island. So a little bit colder uh, air mass is going to be moving in across the Bering. For your icing concerns tomorrow, mainly below 5,000 feet widespread across the entire state. So as we look at the jet stream here, what's driving the low pressure systems out there? Well, we have a very strong jet streak, 160 knots, uh, swinging a westerly flow across the Aleutian chain and the Alaska Peninsula with ridging uh, just across the Gulf of Alaska. Now that's a highly amplified pattern with um, at 9,000 feet, a low pressure system across the Bering and another across the western areas of the Gulf. Here's that strong flow on the bottom side of the low pressure system between 60 to 70 knots. So expect some very uh, fast speeds as it crosses uh, the Alaska Peninsula, lighter speeds out of the south across much of the state, and the southeast is going to be in the 25 knot range. Sorry, I should move over to this side of the screen for you. All right, let's take a look at that at 3,000 feet. Across the southeast, in the lighter flow, around 15 knots at 3,000. Across the Gulf, however, very strong flow around this 
new developing low pressure system between 50 to 70 knots around the core this low. Now the flow across the mainland out of the south, 15 to 25 knots, very strong flow across uh, the bearing, especially on the lower side of this low pressure system between 50 to 60 knots at 3,000 feet. Now let's take a look at your uh, turbulence, sum them all up. We're mainly going to see the turbulence across the Gulf of Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right, well this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, which okay. are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. It's kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how flat I mean, so it could bit. be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. That's it a lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Uh -huh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, because uh -huh. they're stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here. Another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. So th those are the pictures, that if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is you one that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, for us in Alaska is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it edge on oh, like that. Right. So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit, okay. which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite. Those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth, mm -hmm. getting down toward International Space Station elevation. And they're not in the equatorial plane. Rather, their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this. 
and the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Mm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day. And so you get a much closer image. We've got a, a shot from the uh, SUMI NPP satellite. Uh -huh. Uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor. That's an acronym there. Okay. But it's a beautiful shot of Alaska, and you can see so much detail. The kind of detail, because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice, close imagery. You can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage, though, is that the satellite flies by, right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close. <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits. Uh, each has their strength. And amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Oh, Amazing it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Tomorrow's flying weather is going to look much like the previous days as we're going to see widespread IFR to MVFR conditions across the state. We do have a little bit of a break between across the northern areas of the Brooks Range. However, the southern Brooks Range will be in that IFR to MVFR ceiling. Now, across the southern tier of the state, very much the same across the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, we are going to see mainly MVFR across the central areas of the Bering with IFR conditions across the western areas. Perhaps um, a short break of IF, uh, VFR conditions across the eastern Bering. Now across the southeast, expect widespread IFR conditions with snow tomorrow morning. So reduced visibilities and ceilings across the southeast and the panhandle. The areas across the gulf are going to be mainly MVFR for the eastern areas and IFR to the west. Now let's take a look at the afternoon. We will see some improvement across the southeast. However, those northern channels are going to stay in IFR conditions as well as the northern panhandle. We'll see widespread IFR conditions across the southern areas of the state into the southern areas of the Gulf, and we'll see IFR hanging on just to the south of the Brooks Range. Looking across the northern tier, we will see a brief VFR condition for those locations, but widespread MVFR conditions will hang on across much of the western areas of the state, with IFR continuing across the eastern Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula. IFR will also be across much of the Bering for your Thursday afternoon. Now, as we head into Friday, uh, expect the morning hours to be widespread IFR across much of the state, including the southeast, back down to IFR for you, and then we will see widespread MVFR conditions across the Gulf of Alaska. For Friday afternoon, expect conditions to be improving across the area. We'll see some IFR conditions across the central and northern tier of the state, otherwise MVFR across um, the uh, interior locations, and we'll see IFR conditions continuing across the central areas of the Bering, otherwise MVFR conditions are gonna be widespread. Now let's take a look at the passes in more depth We'll see Anatuvik tomorrow, all day, IFR, as well as Adigan Pass will be in the IFR condition. Now, Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will go from IFR to MVFR late day, and we'll see Rainy Pass stay down in IFR conditions. Windy will also be in IFR, and Isabel stays IFR tomorrow, and Mintasta will be MVFR all day. And then we'll see Tanita go from MVFR to IFR and Portage IFR. Well, let's take a look at Chilkoot White Pass, IFR conditions for you tomorrow. 
Now, if you're looking at the freezing levels for tomorrow morning, that's going to be draped across the southeast and hugs along the northern coast and back towards the central areas of the Bering. Now, uh, conditions are going to be a little bit colder with height rises from two to 6,000 feet just south of the Alaska Peninsula, starting up there at Kodiak Island. So a little bit colder uh, air mass is going to be moving in across the Bering. For your icing concerns tomorrow, mainly below 5,000 feet widespread across the entire state. So as we look at the jet stream here, what's driving the low pressure systems out there? Well, we have a very strong jet streak, 160 knots, uh, swinging a westerly flow across the Aleutian chain and Alaska Peninsula with ridging uh, just across the Gulf of Alaska. Now that's a highly amplified pattern with um, at 9,000 feet a low pressure system across the Bering and another across the western areas of the Gulf. Here's that strong flow on the bottom side of the low pressure system between 60 to 70 knots. So expect some very uh, fast speeds as it crosses uh, the Alaska Peninsula, lighter speeds out of the south across much of the state and the southeast is going to be in the 25 knot range. Sorry, I should move over to this side of the screen for you. All right, let's take a look at that at 3,000 feet. Across the southeast, in the lighter flow, around 15 knots at 3,000. Across the Gulf, however, very strong flow around this new developing low pressure system between 50 to 70 knots around the core of this low. Now the flow across the mainland out of the south, 15 to 25 knots, very strong flow across uh, the bearing, especially on the lower side of this low pressure system between 50 to 60 knots at 3,000 feet. Now let's take a look at your uh, turbulence, sum them all up. We're mainly gonna see the turbulence across the Gulf of Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. <laughs>